Hal Humphreys here with PI Education and Pursuit Magazine. Uh, this is our March webinar for 2020. Um, these are strange times. Uh, there's a lot going on in the world that brings us uncertainty. And um, I think we're going to kind of take today and focus on our normal routine for PI education and keep things as normal as possible. Um, we are going to cover some things that we can do in this uncertain time as investigators to uh, maintain our business, uh, keep a good safe practice. But we're also gonna talk about a topic that I am personally, uh, I hate to say it this way, but I'm passionate about it. I love the work of criminal defense investigations. I like working with criminal defense attorneys. And to that end, we have uh, the talented, smart, um, passionate, hard-fighting attorney, Allison Clayton with us today. Allison, welcome. Hi. Um, Allison, tell us a little bit about yourself, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. So my name's Allison. I am the Deputy Director of the Innocence Project of Texas. I'm also the Director of the Innocence Clinic at Texas Tech School of Law. And finally, I have my own appellate and post-conviction practice. Uh, I'm housed in Lubbock, Texas. And um, and yeah, this is the only thing that I do is, is appellate and post-conviction criminal defense work. Um, and I, I stay plenty busy with it. And this is something that if more people were aware of how important the work of investigators is, you know, this is something that would make my job a whole lot easier. So I'm so happy to be here today. Thank you so much for having me. Well, thank you for being here. And uh, just full disclosure, Allison is a longtime friend. Um, she has assisted on some cases that a, a friend of mine who's an attorney and I have worked on in, in crazy, generous ways. Um, I have worked with Allison on occasions, and I always like working on the cases she's working with because they're good, solid post-conviction cases. One of the things that frustrates me as an investigator is, and I think Allison may feel the same way, is there are a lot of times when it shouldn't even get to the post-conviction phase had the work been done right in the first place. Can you talk to him a little bit about upfront trial prep and work that might avoid the post-conviction process, Allison? Absolutely. I think if I had to give an estimate of the, the post-conviction innocence cases that I do, you know, anywhere from 70 to 80% of those cases could have been avoided altogether if the defense attorney had just gotten a good investigator on the case from the get-go. And um, you know, it would have saved this person years of wrongful incarceration. It would have given the victim justice from the very beginning. And because that wasn't done, you know, sometimes we may not be able to get the person out of prison. We may never be able to know who really committed the crime and get the victim any kind of justice. So I really cannot emphasize the importance, especially in the lives of these people, of having a really good investigator on the case. I have a case right now, actually, that is in litigation where that very thing happened. It was a case where there were two murders in um, a very rural Texas town. And um, there's four the state had the theory that co-defendant number one kind of orchestrated everything and then the other people involved were all just thugs that were essentially part of the first co-defendant's master plan. So um, the first defense attorney didn't hire an investigator, was paid to hire an investigator, but didn't. Uh, went to trial four days later, got a guilty conviction, uh, double capital sentences, double capital. Um, yeah. It, it was a it was a non a non death capital so it's life without the possibility of parole but a double mini cap. Um, defense defendant number two goes to trial. His attorney was appointed. Um, that county doesn't really give good money for investigators, so there's there's not an investigator for him. He also got a double mini um, after a four day trial. Defendant number three actually was involved, was in guilt, was in fact guilty, had incredible defense attorneys who really had some excellent investigators. That guy who was the trigger man and who actually shot both the people, he got 33 years on a plea. Defendant number four goes to trial. This is um, five years, four, four or five years after the first defendant goes to, went to trial. 
And uh, he has an incredible defense team. And for the first time that was ever going to go to trial, we finally had a real, real investigator get into the nitty gritty of what really, truly happened. And he just did hours and hours of work. I don't know how much he ended up earning. It was, I'm sure it was quite a bit of money. Um, and he, you know, he uncovered what really happened. He talked to the third co-defendant who explained a whole lot of things, but then the investigator went even further. And he went and talked to the other person who was there who the state hadn't even figured out. They didn't even know about. And uh, he went and, and talked to that person. He got a confession from that person. And then he went further and he figured out everything that these two people had touched when they were on the crime scene. And then he was able to follow, put all of this together to get DNA testing to prove that these two people were on this crime scene. And this was four years later after everything had happened. Um, and so you could imagine that that work has been pretty beneficial to us now because I, I represent the first co-defendant. Um, and so now we're able to go back and try to undo everything that has happened to these people. But imagine if that would have, if he would have just come in at the very beginning of the case, just to get any kind of real investigator in at the very beginning could have saved, I mean, years of life. It could have saved hundreds of thousands of dollars to the county in prosecuting the case because county didn't have a very sophisticated law enforcement system. Um, so it's not like they were gonna do a whole lot, not like they could do a whole lot. Um, and now we're trying to undo all of this. And you know, the damage that's been caused will never be completely undone. But thank, thank goodness, we finally have a, a, a real investigator finally came on and is kind of saving the day for all of us. Right, and that's the, the thing about it is, you know, you said something in the, in the very first part of what you were talking about there, <clears throat> getting justice for the victim's family. If you get the wrong person in jail, and you tell that family, this person did the thing, but they didn't, you're not getting justice for that family. It, it benefits everyone to accuse the right person. It also benefits everyone to accuse the right person of the right thing. That's right. Um, yeah, that's right. <clears throat> on, on, that, it, on that case in, in particular, you know, it, it not only was not, is not justice for the victims, it's not justice for the victim's family, but that guy, the one who was there that the state never figured out because they didn't really do their investigation the right way, he went on to commit more crimes over in uh, in a different state, and now he's in prison on aggravated assault, aggravated sexual assault, and aggravated kidnapping in a different state, in prison in a different state. And if they would have figured that out from the beginning, he wouldn't have been able to go out there and continue victimizing people in our society. Absolutely, no doubt. Um, you know, thinking through this process of the importance of the upfront, and, and I think we've kind of set it up where we can talk about pre-trial stuff for the next, you know, little bit, and then we'll go to post-conviction stuff, because I think that's, that makes sense as a kind of a chronological way to deal with these, these investigative issues, but pre-trial, one of the things I've found is if you have an attorney who gets a case, the sooner you get an investigator involved, the more impact that investigator can have. For instance, um, Dan Hurley, attorney that you know and I know. Um, just quickly, Allison, tell us Dan Hurley's reputation in Lubbock, Texas. Uh, it's beyond Lubbock. It's it's the state of Texas. Dan Hurley is one of the best criminal defense attorneys in the state. He's been doing it for longer, probably longer than I've been alive. Um, and he's just, he's so incredibly well respected. If it was my loved one, I would, I mean, I would sell the house to hire Dan Hurley to represent yeah. this person. So Dan got a case several years ago, um, and it was it was a case where a young man was accused of of murder, and there was a there was a fight and a stabbing, and and Dan called me and he said, hey, and he called me two days after the incident, and said, I need you here tomorrow, and flew me out. We did the investigation. The following week. Um, the DA was asking for, I think, $100,000 bond or $500,000 bond. And Danny asked for a reduction to 30000 And after reviewing the evidence, the judge came back with a $25,000 bond, oh. which was kind of his, his saying, you know, seriously, people. Um, but by getting involved two days after the thing, the, ele the incident happened, we were able to stop the, it didn't even go they took it to grand jury and got a no bill. Wow. Which, Good job. Know, 
never happens. But I mean, like it, it, it wasn't because I was great at my job. I, I think I'm competent. I'm not the best investigator in the world by any means, but it's getting out there and getting started as soon as possible. That's the thing that I think a lot of people don't think about. Um, and on appointed cases, you know, a lot of times it, the lawyers that are appointed, they get appointed several months after the thing happened. But the sooner you can get an investigator involved, the sooner the attorney can get their head in the game on a specific case, I think the better. Do you agree with me on that? Absolutely. And I know we're talking pre-trial and, and I don't want to blur the lines between pre-trial and post-trial, but I mean, I can tell you looking at it from a longer term perspective, people forget things, their memories. I mean, my own memory, you know, I, I, we all have a much worse memory than we realize. And, um, on a lot of these cases, that's what's going to be really important is their memory. But beyond that, sometimes the players involved um, are living really dangerous lifestyles. I have a case right now, in fact, where one of the people who is, who was the real murderer in the case, overdosed. He died of an overdose back in, you know, 2008. And now we can't get his DNA evidence. I mean, I guess, you know, if we wanted to exhume him, would be fine, but he'd been cremated. So, you know, what we can't get his DNA evidence to prove that now. And um, so you have that issue. And then there's other evidence, like the objective evidence tends to just evaporate. So for example, in that one case that I was speaking about at the very beginning, um, the real murderer in the case came in and he said, listen, I can tell you what I did. And it was completely incongruent with the state's theory of the case, but it involved certain items of evidence in the house. For example, it involved, um, one of the things he did was he got a, like a milk gallon full of what he thought was gas and he poured, it was water, but he poured water all down the hall of this house and dumped the the, the, jug, the jug, the empty milk gallon jug um, in one of the bedrooms. And he could, you know, went back and say, I can tell you exactly where that's at. And, you know, you could pick it up and, 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 and test it for my DNA and it's going to be on there. Um, and when you go back through the pictures, you can see, sure enough, there's that empty milk jug in the middle of the room. And it was kind of a messy scene. The police didn't even know about it. And so where's that milk jug now? Well, it was thrown away. We're never gonna be able to get that. We'll never be able to prove that. So it's those kinds of reasons why you need an investigator on your side at the very, very get-go because you have this, this time frame that is just absolutely critical. And there's a lot of evidence that if you don't capture it in that moment, it's gonna be gone forever. Yeah, and and <laughs> the amount of information that, that goes away is astonishing. And the other thing is, once you get to a trial and once a person is convicted, if there's a report and it's on paper, that's how it happened. Now you can go you can go back and get you know recantations and show that that's not how it happened. But if it's on paper, that's how it happened. So the sooner you can get in and, and identify the problems with the state's case, and, and you know, Frank Sellers, dear friend of both of ours, um, and I've had this conversation on a number of occasions. One of the things Frank asks me to do when I'm working for him, he's like, just talk to the people at the very least, talk to the people that the police have talked to and verify that the police are reporting what they said accurately. Because when, when I go out to do interviews and I think, you know, most of the investigators in the room who, who have, you know, seen these webinars in the past, you know, I like to go record the interview stem to stern. So for a number of reasons, number one, the attorney knows exactly what I've asked. And if I missed something, tell me I missed it and I'll go back and try another, you know, drink at the well. But I want the attorney to know everything I've asked. I want there to be a clear, concise record of exactly what was said, because what I don't want to happen is a report that I write that is based on my memory of the conversation becomes part of the record and I've gotten something wrong. Um, I don't think, you know, the police, a lot of times they write reports and that report gets put in, but their transcription doesn't. And that transcription goes away at some point and now you're left with the report. So verify what the police have said you said or the witnesses said um that's one of the most important things i can think of yeah absolutely because i think most police officers are actually you know i don't think they're going to be trying to lie or anything like that but they will put something down in summary format on a report not even realizing that it's going to become important later on 
And then their summary of it, which may or may not be entirely like 100% accurate in a really important way, all of a sudden becomes the key factor, like the linchpin of the state's case. And, you know, it, all the officers that I know would have a very similar um, position as you, like, hey, if I miss something, I, I don't mind my paper being graded. I want to, to have what's right be what's presented to the jury. So it's, I, I mean, it's one of the most important things that you can do to go and, and just talk to the same people that the officers have spoken to and make sure that that's accurate. And I can tell you, we've had a significant number of cases where what that officer said in the report was not accurate, not intentionally. It's just that summary was not really, did not really capture what really happened. Yeah, there was a, there was a case, I, we just wrapped this case up last month. It was actually the last case that went to trial before the Tennessee court shut down um, that I was working on. And there was a crux issue in the case where the police officer, the theory of the, the district attorney was the young man that was in the car was on the phone when he was killed. The police officer gathered the phone up as evidence and did not note whether or not it was turned on or off. The person that logged it in evidence logged that it was not turned on. It was actually turned off, like physically turned off. Um, and that one issue became key because if it was turned off and the police didn't turn it off and the, the one officer said, well, I don't know why I noticed that. That's not important. That's not relevant. Well, it was crazy relevant. He just didn't know it. So, you know, going through and noticing little things like that, if you can do it sooner than later, it's better. You can, you can address it and, and deal with it. Um, but yeah, I mean, and, and again, like Allison said, by and large, most police officers and most district attorneys are good human beings trying to do what they feel is the right thing to do. Most of them are not trying to hide the ball. Most of them are not trying to sneak one by. They're trying to do the right thing. And they, like you said, they don't mind having their paper graded. Um, and if everybody's looking for the actual truth of the matter, that's the way it should work. Um, but sometimes that's not the case. And it's imperative that, that we as investigators dig as much as possible. Um, and yeah. I actually, I have another, if, I don't know, you, you probably should have given me a time limit, Hal, because I have <laughs> another example that just happened, that's, that is, that's exactly what happened. It was a case where um, a man was accused of failing to register as a sex offender in Texas. And the basis of that accusation was a 2002 conviction out of Oklahoma. And the conviction in Oklahoma was for assault with the intent to commit a felony, which on the face of it, that's, that's not a sexual offense. Why would he have to register for that? Um, and so I get the case on appeal, right? And I'm looking at this and that was my first question is why would he have to register for this? This doesn't make a lick of sense. Um, and I went back over the trial transcript and I realized that the person here in Lubbock who's in charge of making those designations of is this person a sexual offender? Um, well, actually, so she, she's the one who took the stand and she said, well, this is what DPS told me. DPS told me DPS in Austin is the one who gets the final call on whether you have to register as a sex offender. And, uh, and she said, well, this is what DPS told me. And that didn't make any sense to me. And you know, me, I'm just an appellate attorney. Like I'm, I'm not an investigator at all. And, and I don't know what all is in, what all tools you have in your bag of tricks. I don't have those tools, but, um, but I knew enough that I could file an open records request. That's easy. So I filed an open records request with DPS and they said, well, we've never heard of this guy. We don't know who he is. And I said, well, uh oh, because I've got a, an officer here in Lubbock saying that she talked to y'all about him and y'all designated him as a sex offender for life. And um, so then that they were like, well, we've never heard of him before. <laughs> and it turns out he doesn't have to register for life because lo and behold, that Oklahoma conviction is not a sex, a sex offense conviction. You don't have to register for that. So, um, so I presented this to the DA's office and I was like, you know, we have a real problem here. This needs to get fixed. And so they did some digging and it turns out that what had happened was is that the local officer wrote to DPS, to the, her normal person at DPS, but that person had left. And instead of just writing to figuring out, okay, who do I need to write to now then? Um, she just said, well, listen, I can look at these guidelines and I can tell that this guy is a sex offender for life and this is what he needs to do. So she was interpreting this kind of 
on her own. And what the officers, what the, I'm sorry, what the prosecutors didn't realize is that the local officers are the ones who are in charge of updating the DPS database. So the investigation that the prosecutor did was to go onto the DPS website and to see, okay, well, DPS in fact does have him classified as that, um, but she didn't go to the, to the source. Anyway, um, so as a result of, of just, just figuring out that one little um, problem that the local police department had, you know, we were able to undo my guy's uh, conviction right before Christmas too, it was a really fun story. Um, but then all of the sex offender convictions uh, that were pending got halted and multiple sex offender convictions that had already occurred, they went back and they found out these people didn't have to register. So all these people's convictions went away. And that was just because, you know, me just as an easy, you know, that was nothing for me. But it, can you imagine if the defense attorney had just like had an investigator say, hey, you know, will we go talk to, go just, just look into this. Like it wouldn't have taken you know, 30 minutes to figure out and they just didn't do it. Look at all the harm it caused. Yeah, and here's, I want to, I want to, I want to, drive this nail home really hard when you say i'm just an appellate attorney i'm not an investigator um that sounds a little bit skewed to me um you're an attorney and i would argue a world-class attorney you're one of the best in the appellate world um number one and number two at the end of the day the skills of an investigator start off with hey this doesn't sound right let me find out why it doesn't hit my ear the right way and then you start digging. So any human being in the United States has the right to issue a FOIA request. Yeah. Any, you don't have to be a licensed investigator to do that. You can, a citizen can ask for freedom of information, you know, information at their will. Now, whether or not the state or whoever has the information gives it to you is a different story, but the curiosity factor is the key part. It's like, this doesn't hit my ear right. I want to find out what, what the deal is. Um, and it's not dealing with conspiracies. It's dealing with this. This doesn't sound right. This really just doesn't sound right. Um, so, yeah, that's the key to being an investigator is curiosity. That's it. Right. Well, and to, to go off of, of what you're saying on that, so the attorney will have certain skills, right, that, that you – you just get after you know going through law school and, and practicing but then the investigator a, a licensed investigator especially has a whole lot more tools than what the attorney has so in the ideal world you, you know we're both bringing something to the table that the other person doesn't have you know it's a perfect complement of of skills and of, of abilities and of tools yeah I, I like to think of it in terms of attorneys by and large and, and you correct me if i'm wrong because i'm not an attorney and we all know this but attorneys i think their job in this realm is to take the facts and figure out how the law applies to those facts investigators our job is to bring the facts be they good facts or bad facts to the attorney so they can then decide how the law applies to these facts that's right. And, you know, I'm not going to be going out into the field normally and getting those facts. That's that's something that your investigator has to do. And then and you just talk, work with whatever he brings you. Let's talk a little bit about why the attorney doesn't want to go out in the field and do that stuff. Oh, sure. Well, <laughs> there's a couple of really important reasons why. Um, the, the primary reason is just almost logistical in a way, and that is if the attorney goes out into the field and speaks with a witness and that witness gives them any kind of information. So say, for example, I were to go in the field and speak to um, a person who says, I saw this happen on this day. Um, and I go to her and she says, well, yeah, I saw this happen, but not on that day. Right. This is different than what the police have reported in their reports. So then we come to trial and I say, hey, what did, what did you see happen? And she says, okay, so what I saw happen. And I say, what day did it happen on? And she says, the day that I told police. Well, that's not what she told me. So how, how am I going to let the jury know that she told me it happened on a different day? The way you have to do that is you, you would have to take the stand. The attorney would have to, to, to get on the stand and to testify to the jury. And, you know, that's, that's just all kinds of uh, of bad, you know, you, clearly you have an interest in the case. They're not going to believe you as much as you can. And then you, you have opposing counsel who gets to cross examine you like, no, that's a nightmare that would, you would never, ever, ever want that to happen. So 
that's the primary reason why you don't do that is is because you can't take this you can but you're not going to take the stand in your own case i would never take the stand in my own case the other reasons are um kind of what we were talking about before you know y'all have a skill set that i don't have i don't interact with people (laughs) just super great um so i don't i don't i should never be in the field talking to people and trying to interpret them is just not something that's really in the wheelhouse of a whole lot of attorneys, believe it or not. So it's just, you know, we can't do everything. We shouldn't do everything. Right. And the other thing, I was going to say, the other thing is that, you know, whenever you're an attorney, especially when you're really in the case and you really believe in your client, um, you're, you're kind of, you're not vested. You don't have a vested interest, but you almost do. You want your, your guy to be innocent. This is what you want the facts to be. And sometimes what you really need is someone who you know and trust to come in and say, I know that this is what you want, but this is not what you're dealing with. These are not your facts. And you really need that balanced perspective to, to be a better attorney. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that independent third party perspective of an investigator coming in and saying, yeah, I mean, I, I'd love for that to be the case too, but here's how it really is. This yeah. is what actually happened and it may suck. And that may, I mean, I've had attorneys get angry with me personally for delivering that information. And it's like, I'm sorry, I, I can't make this shit up. Right. It is what it is. The other thing that I think is really important, it's not, it's not a non-issue. Um, it shouldn't be an issue, but it's, it is an issue, is attorneys have gone through the process of, you know, applying for, being accepted to, going through law school. They've passed the bar. They've registered for you know the criminal defense lawyers association they they they, they're going to charge x number of dollars per hour to do the work they do investigators by and large and i I, you know i've got two or three investigator friends around the country that are top tier investigators that have law degrees and but they work in cities that command higher fees so but the difference in an attorney's hourly rate an investigator's hourly rate is fairly substantial most of the time. And what you want to do is use your resources as efficiently and effectively as possible. And if you're paying somebody $400 an hour, I don't think it's a good use of their time to be out knocking on doors, talking to witnesses. If you're paying someone $150 an hour, that's a better use of their time. That's exactly correct. And let me tell you too, especially with most attorneys I know, you're going to get a lot more bang for your buck if you have an experienced investigator out there interacting with these people and doing their job than you would if I'm fumbling around trying to do the same thing at, you know, a higher rate. Right. Right. So those are, those are some of the key things. I think we've kind of covered the pre-conviction stuff uh, pretty well. And now we're going to get into Allison's wheelhouse. Before we do that, I want to take just a second and say thank you all for joining us today. I have no idea how many people are in the room. It really doesn't matter what happens at the end of the day as these live on our website into perpetuity and we get upwards of, you know, 500 to 1,000 views per webinar and that's where our value really ends up being. Um, But if you're in the room today, just underneath the screen, there's a subscribe button on YouTube. Click on that. It doesn't cost you anything at all and it helps us out to have more subscribers. Um, I do want to acknowledge that we are in a strange time in our country, in the world. There are some events going on that are out of all of our control. Um, Take some time. If you can't be in the jails talking to clients, in the field talking to witnesses, if you can't be doing those things, take a little bit of time to work on your business. Um, I had a conversation last week with... um, with a couple of other investigators uh, across the country. uh, And one of them said, white space on the calendar is the devil. So if you find yourself with nothing to do, take out a calendar, write down things that you want to do to improve your business, improve your skill set. If there's something that you'd like to learn how to do, now's a good time to do that. Um, To that end, if you have any interest in taking education online here at PI Education, we're offering, I think, one of the largest discounts we've ever offered. Um, if you use the discount code MARCH2020, MARCH2020, that'll get you a 30% discount off of any of the classes on um, PI Education. Uh, and in the interim, we will be coming to you with free content, as we always do. This webinar is totally free and open to the public. Um, 
anybody uh, can join in and, and play along. The other thing is this afternoon at five o'clock, we are hosting at PI Education another virtual happy hour. Uh, Kim Green has posted the link to that in the various social media um, postings and in the email blast. I don't know how many people we can have in the room, but we're going to leave it wide open. And as many of you want to join in, join in. It's a good time. Uh, it's a chance to just very casually and conversationally share a drink, get some face time, and find out what other investigators around the country are doing in this strange and weird time. Uh, coming back to Allison Clayton. Allison, thank you for being here today. I can't, I mean, I seriously can't thank you enough. It's, um, it's always exciting for me to have the incredibly smart attorneys that I know join us on this thing. I think it helps the, uh, the PI set out to get a perspective of what it is attorneys want from their investigators. Let's move on to post-conviction. All right, so it doesn't matter what happened in the conviction phase. It doesn't matter what happened pre-trial, at the trial. We're now dealing with the person has been convicted of crime and they claim that they're innocent and they've brought in the Innocence Project. Walk me through a case for the Innocence Project and make a case for why it's important work to do and what is the process. And you can have as much time as you need. Yay. Oh, you're going to regret that one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so once a person has been convicted, um, we're, we're in a, a real mess because just from a legal standpoint, you have to understand the further you get out from the incident itself, the more and more difficult it is to undo what's already been done. So if a person comes to us, I mean, right after their appeal has been, you know, they've lost on their appeal, then it's still an uphill battle because the legal standards that we have to meet to get that conviction overturned. What we essentially have to have in a lot of cases is we need to have proof that either this crime did not happen or this crime did happen and here's who really did it. And that is something that, you know, innocence attorneys will, will get into arguments over um, is whether we should have to prove who really committed the crime. We shouldn't, it's not fair, but that's the reality of our situation so many times. So what that boils down to is, uh, we have to become investigators in the case. We have to start everything from the very beginning and figure out what really happened, where things went wrong. And we have to figure out a, a way that we can present this uh, in a persuasive manner to get this conviction overturned. That is very, very, very difficult to do. Um, but imagine having that job and adding 20 or 30 years on top of it. And it becomes just a Herculean burden, actually. It's just insanely difficult to do. Uh, but, you know, that's, that's what we do. That's the job. Um, and so whenever we have a case that comes in, well, let's just say it's a case where there really was a crime that happened. So it was a murder case is typically where you have, you absolutely know there's, you know, the corpus delecti is right there. Uh, you, you know, this really did happen as opposed to a lot of sexual offense cases where you get recantations and they say, yeah, this has never even happened. Um, those are a whole lot easier, believe it or not, because then you can just have, especially those he said, she said, you just have the person get up and say this never happened and hope for the best. Um, but in a case where it actually happened, you know, I, I've got a lot of cases right now, a lot of murder cases right now, where you go in and you say, okay, first off, um, what were you doing at this time? Do you have any kind of an alibi? that we can establish. Surprisingly, a lot of times uh, they will have an alibi. They will have told that alibi to the jury and the jury just didn't buy it. So I have a case right now where a man is uh, serving two 99 year sentences for aggravated kidnapping and um, aggravated in, or indecency with a child. Um, he's totally innocent. But um, in that case, he had three different witnesses um, say he was at home talking to his grandmother on the phone. And there's a phone bill that shows that in fact, his grandmother was on a phone call to his house at this time, at the time of the kidnapping. So you have the phone bill and you've got the grandma, the mom and the dad saying, yeah, you know, the grandma saying he's on the phone with me and the mom and the dad are saying we were on the room while he was talking to his grandma, while this kidnapping was happening 20 miles away. 
So um, a lot of times juries don't believe alibis, but, um, and they didn't in that case because, you know, loved ones of course will lie to save their, their loved ones. But in any event, um, that's where we start out is, okay, do you have an alibi that your defense attorney just never figured out and can we prove that alibi? After that, you go on to, okay, the victimology of the case, right? Who is this victim? If you did not do this, then who did do this? And like I said before, you really are just starting from scratch doing your investigation and just hoping and praying that the witnesses and the evidence will still be there given the passage of 20 or 30 years. Um, so yeah, a lot of it really is, is, and I can't tell you, like I've, I've gotten pretty good at, you know, using Google to search for people, <laughs> but um, that's what you have to do is you have to say, okay, so here are the other witnesses in the case. Here are the other people who are, who are factors and, and take it from there and see, can I still find this person? I haven't found this person. Where is this, you know, is, has this person passed away? Have they moved? What's going on with this person? And, um, and it is, it's, it's really, really difficult. We don't have investigators. Uh, some innocence projects, a few innocence projects do have investigators, most do not. So a lot of times it's the, the attorneys kind of, um, you know, like I said, using Google and doing the best that we can to try to locate these people. Um, but- hey, I, I, would, I would say that, you know, there are times when I know a lot of investigators are willing to do pro bono work. Um, you know, you and I have discussed it. We've we've tried to work on a couple of cases where it was a pro bono situation and just scheduling can be a problem. You know, finding the time when, you know, I'm a traveling PI, so I've got to be near, at least near the area to do the work, right? Um, but scheduling can be a real issue for um, investigators that are working in that kind of, uh, system. The other thing is there's, if there's any money in the process to pay anybody, I mean, you gotta, you just, you have to start with the attorneys because they're the ones that are by and large in the appellate process are the ones doing the heavy lifting. Um, and then if there's any leftover that can go to investigators possibly, but there are a lot of investigators, I think across the country, um, that would be willing to work on some of these kind of cases if they just knew how to do it. So how can investigators learn where the innocence projects are and how to reach out to you guys? Sure. Yeah. If, if you look at the, um, there's, you can think of innocence projects almost like as franchises in a way. So you have the innocence project that everybody thinks about. That's actually the innocence project in New York city. They serve, um, they do a lot of federal work, but they're not really serving your local states. So uh, there's innocence projects all over the, the country. Some states have them, some states don't. If you go to the Innocence Network's website, you'll see there's an interactive map that will show you what, inter what, what innocence projects are all around in, in your state. Um, and from there, I would reach out to the local IPs, the innocence projects, and, and you know, say, hey, I'm an investigator. I'm here to help, what can I do? Um, I know whenever we have investigators do that, there's never really a shortage of, of work to be done. So, um, so you'll usually get, at least in my experience, you know, okay, this is, this is what we need. And you'll just get like a mountain of work or, or not. Um, we try to work with, with our volunteers to say, how much you know, time are you looking at here? What's your scheduling like? Um, of course, the difficulty is just like with the really good attorneys, the really good investigators stay very busy. And so we try to, like, I'm trying to find people and I still try to find people on my own so that then I can get the investigator and say, hey, please go talk to this person. I found them, you go talk to them. Just don't, don't put me out in the field. <laughs> um, and, and, and to that issue, and this is, we talked prior to starting this webinar, um, this is a chance for you to throw me under the bus. Um, you know, we, we, investigators, we, the, the one small little tool bag that we have that is different from a lot of attorneys, we do have access to some databases that can help us narrow down searches for human beings. Um, Alice and I worked on a case a couple of years ago where they had found a witness said, hey, go talk to this person. I just took the information and ran with it and burned up basically a day and a half's worth of time. And I did not verify that it was the right person. I didn't do my own research. And that was my fault. And I wasted their time. And 
we ended up we ended up finding the person somewhere else and it was it was the hispanic version of john smith was the name basically um but taking the time to research and do the work as an investigator up front is is terribly important and then the attorneys are out there doing again they're trying to correct me if i'm wrong allison but you're you're trying to deal with legal issues legal arguments how the law applies to facts and googling people and trying to identify witnesses and 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 it's it's overwhelming it really is overwhelming yeah absolutely it's overwhelming and um you know i don't remember i mean i kind of sort of remember the incident that you're talking about i will never ever throw you under the bus um <laughs> but I think that was one of the ones where the family had told us, if I'm not mistaken, like, this is where he's at. This is the person. And we had just, I didn't double check it either. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, no, it's, it's so much work whenever you're on the innocent side of it and you're working with a very, very limited budget already yeah. um, to, to be able to, to do everything and to have to do everything because that's what the case requires. I mean, yeah. And, and imagine, you know, that's, that would just be, a lot for one case but you know we've got I've got what 30 cases on my innocence docket alone right now and I've got like another 50 on my own private docket um, and that's 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 crazy right and we've got I don't know how many hundreds of people just waiting in line for us to look at their cases to get to the cases and so there's just never you, really an end to work yeah I want to get to some questions from the field I, I, I apologize to the folks listening we've been letting the questions pile up that is on me um, it's because I love listening to Allison talk, and I don't want to interrupt her any more than I have to. But uh, we got a couple of questions here. Uh, Mark L. asks, as a 60-year-old paramedic ready to retire, I have desire to become a private investigator. Criminal investigations is an area that I'm greatly interested in. Is my age an issue to begin in the field? Absolutely not, Mark. Here's the thing. As we were talking earlier, the primary requirement to being a good investigator is curiosity. A 60 year old retired paramedic can volunteer their time and their curious mind and their skills of research to an innocence project tomorrow. And I think they would be happy to have the help. Um, so that's not at all a problem. Um, somewhat, Steve, please differentiate between the criminal investigator and the attorney's paralegals or junior attorneys. All right. So I think what he's asking is what's the difference between an investigator and a paralegal? Oh, you're asking me. <laughs> okay. So you're sorry. Oh, no. you're, um, your investigator is the person who's going out in the field and interacting with people um, and doing like finding your facts for you. The paralegal is the person who will do the very um, menial is not, not the right word, but uh, very basic legal tasks. So if you have forms that you need to fill out before you, for example, in Texas, we have a form that you have to fill out before you file. Um, to get a conviction reversed. It's an easy form, but it's a long form and it takes a lot of time. So that's something you have the paralegals to do. Um, or, you know, if you are going to get a bunch of letters out, your client update letters, the really simple tasks that, that are still nevertheless something that a, the, the attorney would do, that's what the paralegals do. But the paralegals are not in the field. And sometimes um, I know you've, uh, interns will do case research and stuff like that, but I know some attorneys use their paralegals who are really experienced paralegals to do case research and stuff like that. But it's the investigator's job is to go out and deal with factual issues, possibly reviewing a case file, looking for new witnesses, digging through, trying to find out someone that the police did or didn't talk to that kind of business. Um, but I think by and large investigators are the ones that are going to be out there in the field to witnesses and reviewing discovery and getting that stuff. And the paralegals are the ones that are going to be helping the attorneys do their job, like the legal part of the job. Is that right? That's correct, 100%. Okay. Um, somebody, uh, Jacob asked, I'm going to catch 22. I'd like to do criminal defense work, but don't have experience. How can I break into the field? Are you curious, Jacob, if you are, if you have any skills of research, um, if you're already an investigator and you'd like to do criminal defense work, volunteer for an Innocence Project somewhere. Check out their website and see if there's one in your state or your area. Uh, talk to attorneys in your state or local area who take appointed cases. Um, they can get you appointed if you're licensed as an investigator. 
and they can help you get the experience on a, an appointed case. And any help you give an appointed attorney that he doesn't have to pay for, the courts will pay for your services. Any help you can give that attorney is going to be it. Even if you're not crazy experienced at the work, you can learn on the job and still provide help that they wouldn't have gotten had they not had your services. So there are ways to break into this business that, um, that are, you know, they help you get experience to help you learn how to do the job, but you're also uh, providing real help to the attorneys. And can I add on that some? Yeah, please, so, please. Uh, the criminal defense world is actually a really small community of, of the, uh, of the really good attorneys, right? So the, the, the good attorneys know who the good investigators are. And so, I mean, that's the reason why Hal and I know each other. I'm in Texas and he's in Nashville is because it's a really small world. So if you break in on a case, an appointed case, I mean, or a volunteer case, and you do a really good job for a good attorney, it will spread like wildfire. And before you know it, because there's plenty of attorneys in the field, I don't know how many private investigators there are out there because Hal's my go-to guy, but um, there's a ton of attorneys out there, but there's a very small number of really, really good attorneys out there. And I'm assuming it's probably the same way with, with private investigators. So once word gets out that you're good, then, then that's it. Then you're set. Then you'll be, you know, the, in my experience, then, then you'll be booked. Yeah, I think you're right. And, and here's the thing. I think at the end of the day, um, the people that get credit for being the best investigators and the best attorneys, they might, they might not be the smartest. They might not be the most well-credentialed, um, but they're the ones that show up every day to do the work. If you show up and you're competent, then you get to the level of some of the best in the country. So, you know, it, it's a matter of, you know, I'm a big fan. I, it never crossed my mind, Allison, and I, I, it shocks me sometimes, but when I started taking, um, when I started taking appointed cases, the money's not good. I mean, it's really not. Um, in Tennessee, the, the administrative office of the courts pays attorneys $50 an hour. Attorneys, $50 an hour. Um, they pay investigators $50 an hour. I find that alone to be a criminal offense. I, I, when I started getting appointed cases, I started out at $75 an hour. So, yeah. <laughs> so, but here's the thing. In a time like this, when, you know, insurance investigators are not out doing surveillance because everybody has been ordered to stay home. So that, that work has kind of dried up. Appointed work is paid work and $50 an hour is better than no dollars an hour. Yeah. Right? And you know, you know, too. Yeah, for sure it is. Um, and you can leverage it. Like I was saying before, you do a really good job um, on, for me, my $75 an hour, my very first appointed case did an awesome job on it to be real. And I mean that I have seen that payback so many more fold than that $75 an hour. If you just really knock it out of the park, it'll come back to you. Um, the other thing too, that you should keep in mind and who knows how long this mess that we're in right now is going to last, but I know a lot of criminal defense associations all around the nation are trying to get our work declared as essential work so that we can keep going when other fields can't. So that could be something too, that would be beneficial. Yeah. And, 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 Again, as Allison was saying, if you take on appointed work, and, and, and here's the thing, I find it really useful for investigators and attorneys to check their ego at the door. Um, this work is, it's, it's bigger than any of our individual egos. I will take work for $50 an hour for the administrative office of the court because I feel like it's really important work to do, number one. Number two, $50 an hour is, is nothing to shake a stick at. It's not great, but I'll take it because I got, I got bills to pay and I've got, you know, a life to live. Um, but if you take that $50 an hour work and you do a really good job and you pay attention to your attorney client and you help them out as much as you can, I guarantee you when that young attorney who's taken appointed work gets a private pay case because he's been kicking ass and doing a really good job, he's going to think, oh, and I need $10,000 $10, in escrow for my investigator. And that's in addition 100%. to my fees. Um, that that work pays off in spades in the long run. I do want to take just a second and and, and remind the folks in the room and the folks watching the YouTube channel. Um, Steve Mason did an article for Pursuit Magazine several months ago, where he provided a link to the Innocence Project's 
uh, across the country and the, the website where you're talking about the map with the states and go we'll post that at the end of this uh, webinar well i think we can tag it to the pursuit magazine homepage for a bit it's a great resource you can go find innocence projects around the country and you know i know allison will agree with this volunteer time please do yeah um allison it's uh we're bumping up right on 10 minutes left to go any last things you'd like to say to the crowd before we call it a day um yes but i you know i'll try to limit it to 10 minutes but no guarantees um you know the work of an investigator i really cannot emphasize in these criminal defense cases you're saving lives you're you're changing lives like it's it's really really important work that can have lifelong impacts for for the individuals but also for i say the greater good for our society you know like that's a really important function that that I'm so thankful we have people out there who will serve that function because it's not something that we can do on our own. Um, and if you are lucky enough to be able to be able to defend somebody, then thank you first and foremost for doing that and for doing a really good job because you're saving so much time and pain and effort in the future. Um, if you're coming in afterwards, and you know the convictions already happened, but you still want to help. Please reach out to your local innocence project and and offer to help. And I can tell you, they're not probably going to be able to pay you anything because our IPs just don't get a whole lot of money. Most of them are donor funded, and um, they're all nonprofits. So can you know, I, we'll can just have to pay you in warm fuzzies. But yeah, go on. If if a, if an investigator comes and works on an innocence project case pro bono, they're not getting paid and all they get is warm fuzzies out of it, but they do a fantastic job for you or they, they just show up and do the work where, that no one else is doing. Um, when you get a call from an attorney that's got a paid case and he says, do you know any good investigators? Who are you going to refer them? Oh, I'm going to refer that, that PI that came and helped me out. Not only that, but I can tell you at, at our Innocence Project at least that whenever we have somebody who does a really good job we will go above and beyond to publicize that person for us. I mean, we're talking about awards nominations. We're talking about any kind of publicity because on these innocence cases, realize that you get a lot of media, a lot of press on these cases. So whenever you're seeing this person walking out of the courtroom, you're going to see the attorney. And if there's a, a PI on the case, you're going to see that PI right next to the attorney. And guess who's getting all the credit? If it's with our IP at least, and I'm sure other IPs too, then the the the, uh, the people who have helped you get there are the ones who are getting the credit. So we go out of our way to publicize people who help us because we recognize that this is one of the ways that we can help this person and kind of repay them. Yeah. So at the end of the day, if if you can't get your head around just like benevolence, um, you know, you can, you can at least get your head around business development. That's right. <laughs> um, Allison, really quickly, going towards the the end of this thing, tell me. What does it feel like when you get a really good outcome? Oh man, those are the moments that I live for, right? That when you see a man reunited with his family or you see a mother reunited with her son, I cannot, like there is no greater high in the world than, than that moment. I mean, it, like everything in that moment clicks, everything makes sense and you know like this is why this is why i have the skills that i have and i know a lot of people who've been through those moments um attorneys investigators um and they would all universally agree it is indescribably fantastic it will bring you joy for the rest of your life on the darkest of times you always have it like it goes so far beyond what you can comprehend Absolutely. It's if you get a good result, which in the shame of it is, it can be a rare occasion to get a great result. But when you get one, um, it, it and here's the thing, it doesn't only bring joy, or at least resolution and closure to your clients life and their family. But it can also help the victims family come to some clarity and resolution and understand that they've I'm, I'm thinking specifically of Michael Morton's son who had been told from a, a very young age that his dad killed his mom and he had to struggle with after his dad was released you know how do I how do I get my head around 
my dad didn't kill my mom because I believed that my whole life. You know what I'm saying? It's so the work we do on this side of, of the criminal justice world, when it, when you get a good result and they don't happen that often, but when you do, it's such a good, good feeling. And you want to, you want to stand on the rooftop and yell <laughs> yeah. most like, yeah, what? But it, it just feels so good. It's incredible. It's, it makes everything worth it. I mean, it's just, and it's indescribable. That's why everybody should go out there and, and find that experience for yourself and then you'll understand it. Yeah. Allison, thank you so very much for being here today. I, I, if I could thank you enough, I would. Next time I'm in Lubbock, I'm going to buy you a glass of wine. Nice. I'll take you up on that. Thank you for having me. It's been a real joy. Yeah, thanks. And have uh, have a good weekend and a safe weekend. Uh, are you guys in lockdown out there in Lubbock? Are you kidding? In Lubbock, they're never going to put us under lockdown. Um, but the the we're trying to self-quarantine as much as we can. Okay, good. Um, for the folks in the room, one more time, March 2020 is a discount code you can use at PI Education if you need education or if you just want to take this time to uh, uh, further your education you can do that. March 2020 is a discount code. It's 30% and it's good until the end of the month. Um, it will stop on the 31st. Uh, again, I'm Hal Humphreys. This is PI Education Pursuit Magazine's webinar for the month of March 2020. It's a strange time. Be safe out there. If you don't have to be out, don't be out. Allison, thank you. Thanks, Hal. I sure appreciate you. Be safe. All right.